or decided this this wasn't what they wanted to do or, you know, given this big shift and that they were now out of work, that they were going to go back to school or pursue a new interest. So I think a lot of that plays a part. Um, it's been it's been hard for everyone. Um, so definitely a, a big piece of that, I would argue, is the pandemic. And Jenea, within your realm, how has the pandemic affected the convention center? Yeah, I mean, for a period of time there, um, it completely decimated it. Um, so we had nothing for a period of time. Uh, what I would say about our organization is um, we tend to, and our leadership supports this, we tend to really think outside of how the norm is done. And, and it would have been very easy to say, you know, we can't be open, we can't do anything. But I know a lot of my time during the pandemic was spent liaising with public health, uh, writing plans on behalf of our clients and our customers so that if there were opportunities to host, so I'm not necessarily talking about when there were formal complete shutdowns, but when there were gathering numbers and there were guidelines, um, I spent a lot of my time working with public health to find a way to host a Mooseheads game in a safe way, to have an Alan Doyle concert in a big giant room with only 200 people because that's how we had to set it up for spacing. Um, but you know, it was, it was, we, we, we take our roles, um, at, at, in our organization very seriously. And, and as it relates to the city and the province, we have a duty to, to keep pushing through, uh, and, and looking at different ways to do things. Um, and we, we spent a lot of time doing that. So throughout the course of the pandemic, um, and I, I will get back to the labor thing in a second, but it was very interesting because we did spend a lot of our time talking to our counterparts across the country, uh, who were not in the same position that we were and who were not hosting events and who just couldn't figure it out. So, that's a source of pride for me and for, you know, on behalf of my, my, my coworkers and our leadership team. Um, you know, I really felt like we were responsible and did everything we could to keep pushing through, but, uh, it was really hard. It was really hard to keep going. And there were days where, you know, I questioned what I was doing in the industry, but, um, you know, you, you, you keep going, you keep doing what you can do as it relates to labor. Um, one of the things I echo everything that you've said, uh, I also, one of the opportunities we took, uh, which we had never done before was look at um, organizations that represent individuals who typically face barriers to employment on a regular basis. Um, and so very slow uh, into, into that, but we have developed some really great relationships with organizations like Easter Seals and Reachability and Autism Nova Scotia, um, because what we, through the process of having no one work for us because we had no business for a period of time, resuming, uh, we quickly identified, you know, although there are several opportunities in our organization for skills, uh, for, you know, management certificates and degrees, there are also a lot of opportunities uh, for people who um, simply want to enter the workforce in an entry-level role. And we were able to take a look at how we were marketing ourselves and, and really realize that, um, you know, we've got an opportunity for everyone. And once again, as an organization uh, that is really, you know, our primary purpose is to really drive drive growth and, and economy in Nova Scotia and in Halifax, um, what better way uh, to, to start kind of living up to that uh, than have individuals who really represent the city and the province that we live in. Uh, so I'm really proud of that aspect. And, you know, we, we once again have just started, we've got a long way to go, but it's made some great relationships and, and some things, we've done some things we're, we're, we're proud of. So. Yeah. You look like you have something to add on to that. I was just going to say, I think that's awesome. And I think that is something that's happening more and more. We at the hotel are doing the same. And there are so many incredible community organizations here to partner with. That's been um, a weird but wonderful silver lining to all of this was there was time to evaluate some of those pieces. So I think that's a great point. And Susan, how has it affected the tour business? Um, well, I, I gotta say it, uh, our tours specifically, I don't think that we were as hard hit from other tour operator perspectives and it's because, um, yes, we, uh, host a lot of people from out of province and, and travelers coming into Nova Scotia, but we also have a lot of locals as well. So when people weren't able to travel outside of Nova Scotia, everybody was trying to find experiences to to do within Nova Scotia. So we really seen just like a huge uptake in the amount of locals that we hosted. I mean, it still was, um, you know, a huge drop um, 
for, you know, sales and whatnot for those few years. But we were lucky in that case that we had just a unique experience, I guess, that was able to host a lot of uh, a lot of locals. And then, of course, uh, just being as a uh, small business owner, I mean, you always kind of wear all of the hats of your business until you can grow to a certain size. So um, during some of the shutdowns, um, of course, we couldn't operate tours, but for the chain yard side, we could still sell cider doing home deliveries. So I just became a delivery driver <laughs> every day. It was amazing. And I thought, this is just great. It's just very, you know, anyways, people were so happy to see you when you deliver cider to the door. <laughs> Uh, but yes, as a small business owner, that's just, you just do whatever you have to do to keep going on sort of thing. You don't, we don't have the, uh, um, you know, the, the benefit of having, you know, different departments and whatnot that we can rely on. It's just, you kind of just do everything, but yeah. Maybe that's why you looked a little bit familiar. <laughs> have you had maybe a similar experience with your tours in Halifax at all? Yeah, so our experience is very similar to Janae's. We went to zero basically uh, visitation um, during those, well, the, the, the main COVID year. And then we saw a slight bounce back in 2021. I think what struck me is that how, how um, rapidly it's come roaring back. So we had one of the best years uh, that we've ever had um, last year. And we were sort of 10% below 2019 levels. So we went to we went from zero to 100 miles an hour. It seemed like um, very quickly. Um, and labor shortage is affected as two. Um, although we're seeing signs this year that um, our applications are getting back to where they were pre 2020. But certainly last year we were probably 10 positions short um, on the front line. So I, you know, because our business is so seasonal, um, so intensely seasonal. Um, even though we run programming until the mid-December now, but you know that main period between <coughs> May and October is you know our bread and butter. So um, and often you uh, and and the bulk of our workforce that we rely on goes back to school in September. So that two-month period in September and October is always has always been for us a kind of um, filling gaps period because. You know, you get to a point where you just can't hire someone for four weeks work, that kind of thing. So managers are frequently on the front line in that time period. What was scary about last year was that managers were on the front line in May and June. So um, that that shortage on the front line leads to strain further up the, you know, further uh, in the organization. And so, you know, by the end of December, people were fairly tired. So <laughs> that was one of the main impacts anyway. And all four of you are in the tourism business for an obvious reason. I mean, you obviously have a love for the tourism and showing Nova Scotia. Um, but what are your like main dislikes and likes and challenges about being in the industry? I'll start with you. Um, well, I suppose my likes are some to some extent they're specific to the place I work. So. Um, <laughs> I, 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 when I go in every morning, I think, oh, this is pretty cool. I'm walking into a 19th century fort. Uh, it's not a, like, it's not a regular office, uh, that kind of thing. Um, um, because I've had an interest in that subject matter since I was a kid. So to some of that, it's, it's, it's pretty personal. Um, I, the other aspect of the kind of, uh, kind of model that we run is that, um, we um, we rely a lot on young people to deliver our program. So I get to work with young people and I you get to see them progress. And that's a pretty fulfilling part of the way that we do business. Um, in terms of challenges, well, labor is the biggest one right now. And then I also find that anticipating what the next thing is going to be in terms of um, uh, either the cruise industry is a good example of that. Uh, for a long time, we were we were running programs where we were running fairly high volume, um, um, and being very successful at that. And then from that, there was like there seemed to be just a few little changes, and all of a sudden that program went from like twenty thousand a year to like um, basically nothing. It was the changes in the tour operator. This is over expanded time, but there was true changes in the tour operator, uh, changes in the way the cruise lines were wanting to um, program, and um, it, you know you would not have anticipated when that program was running full bore that there would 
there was anything that was going to stop it. And then two years, three years later, we had to totally um, switch gears in terms of the way that we were putting together program for, for shore excursions. So, you know, that ability to anticipate and have a sixth sense about, you know, how, what the duration and um, um, populator of a certain type of program is going to be is, is one of the challenges. Thank you. I'm going to ask everyone the question. So. Um, I, I can't think of anything in particular that I dislike. Um, I, I would say that one of the realities of hospitality and tourism is that it is not a nine to five job. And, and there are some roles that allow for that, but even in someone, even in a role like mine, where I am fairly senior in my organization, um, it doesn't always, I, do, I don't have a nine to five schedule. Um, and things like, for example, the World Junior Hockey Championship, that was an event that happened over Christmas and it happened at the end of our typical busy period in the fall. And, you know, it was really, everyone was tired, but it was this exciting event, but we were all working over Christmas and, you know, you have to kind of, there's a reality about this business that I think is just a consideration for people. I, I personally wouldn't call it a dislike. Um, because I, I, I think I'll move into, you know, more what kind of gets me up and inspires me. And that's really, um, you know, I've been with my organization for 15 years. Um, I started as an event manager and now uh, oversee the operation, um, and almost, almost all of the entire employee base for Scotiabank Center and the Halifax Convention Center. And that's pretty cool. I get to, you know, get up every day, come in, things are different. We've got different customers. We've got fans who expect things we've got, you know, there's always something different happening. So I feel really fortunate, um, you know, to be in the role that I am and, and, you know, it's the excitement and the, the, the changes day to day. It's always something new. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're in hospitality and tourism, you're in it because you love it. And if you don't, I think you'll find it really hard to, to continue in that um, because it really is, a, it's a passionate thing. And what I have found personally is, um, like I said, you're, if you're in it and you love it, uh, you'll do well, you'll take advantage of opportunities. But um, if not, I think it would be really hard to, to get up and come to work every day because it's not the same as any, any other industry. So. Um, I could probably echo a lot of the similar things that uh, these two have said previously, but um, one thing I'll just kind of mention uh, what Rod was saying about the cruise industry is something that I'm dealing with right now. And it's kind of, um, it's one of the things that I really like about what I do, but it's also one of the biggest challenges I find is that um, just in case you're, you don't fully understand the cruise industry yet from a tourism perspective, um, it's very different because the people that are coming in from cruise ships, they're not necessarily choosing Halifax as their destination like other travelers that are flying here or driving here they are choosing actively saying i want to go visit nova scotia because of this, this reason and they're usually really easy to impress when you take them on a tour and you educate them entertain them showcase the wine and the food that we have they are so impressed like this is the best thing that they've done but the cruise industry is a little bit different because like I said, you know, sometimes they're just coming here because they're on a cruise ship and Halifax has to be the stop. And sometimes they don't know where exactly they are coming to Halifax. So it's really hard to impress them and really hard to make experiences that really capture them. And that's what myself and uh, my staff that work for me, we all have the same passion about just loving and really appreciating um, the agricultural industry that we have here, the food that we make, the wine that we make and, and showcasing that. And so we're always kind of, I guess, challenged with just trying to make different experiences and trying to really impress people that necessarily, you know, haven't chose Nova Scotia as the, kind of their top destination. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how much more I can say that's not been said. I, I will say, I suppose, personally, in terms of a challenge right now is what I'm finding is kind of going back to the labor shortage. So trying to tread the line and find the balance or harmony between you need to get more people. You also have to be realistic with with what you can get and who you have. And you you know, we want to create the most memorable positive guest experience. So having people be able to 
work their hardest, be excited, be engaged so that they are contributing to that memorable guest experience while recognizing sometimes we're understaffed and so people may be working more than normal in some cases. And so how do you support them to provide the most memorable guest experience? And it's just, I guess it is, it's more of a balancing act in that respect right now. So for me, that's a challenge because I want to see everyone feeling you know, rested and excited when they come into work. But sometimes I know that people are working longer hours or an extra day here and there. And so I recognize that that's a reality and that can be more challenging for them, but still needing to tap into and get them excited. So it's a challenge. It's also really exciting to be looking at how to keep people engaged and really actively, you know, connecting with our staff. So it's it's good and bad. And, you know, the thing that I like most, I started at the casino early on in my HR career. And, you know, it's not a hotel, it's not, but it's within hospitality. And it was the people and no two days are the same. And it's kind of a small child's dream to like work at a hotel, isn't it? So that's quite exciting. Thank you very much. And obviously some of the challenges that the four of you have presented have come through just like changes over the years. Um, could we expand a little bit further maybe on changes that you've seen happen in the industry and maybe some trends and changes going forward in the industry that our students might be getting into? Jenea, you look like you're thinking. Um, I mean, for me, one of the biggest changes in the industry, but it's it's more about how we interact with um, our, our our customers, our promoters. I think the notion of an experience is changing, um, and it's becoming more and more important. Because um, I even remember early on in my career, I don't know that we looked at what we do and the events that we deliver at our venues in through the same lens. We took a lot of direction from our customers and, you know, help let them make decisions on certain things and kind of just sort of stood back and kind of said, well, it's their event. They know what they want. Where we've shifted as an organization is, and I think part of this has come out of COVID, but it was, we had started this work before when we opened the convention center was really around understanding our role as an advisor we do this all the time where customers uh, or or promoters do something from time to time. It's an annual conference. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a show here and there. Um, we have the expertise to really help guide and, and really provide more uh, support in that manner to, uh, to our, to our customers uh, and, and, really taking that seriously. So not setting back anymore. And, and we've seen it pay off. We've had, uh, you know, we've had in the last couple of years, we've had some fairly significant events um, that have come to Halifax and using that model of being a, being a, uh, you know, support and being an advisor uh, to help those, those customers understand, or, you know, based on our experiences, how things could be better and how we can collectively deliver this, this amazing experience. Uh, it, it's paid off because we've had some really great success and some really great feedback on that. Uh, when I think of Scotiabank Center and, you know, it's an aged venue. Uh, when I think about the accessibility expectations, when I think about what is it like now to go to a concert, um, where, you know, 25 years ago or 45 years ago when the building was built, it's a much, it's a very different experience and, and our, our fans and our guests have a very different expectation. Um, so I, I just see some of that changing that people are really looking for this experience. And if you can do it really well, uh, it becomes that memory, it becomes that that opportunity um, uh, for, for them to really carry that with them in future. And it just becomes a really successful thing, so. Rod, perhaps you have something to add on? Uh, well, I guess I've been struck um, a little bit. This is more kind of less tourism and more museums, but it's part of the attraction, I guess. So it has relevance in that respect. <laughs> With the there's big been a big trend in um, um, digital immersive experiences, um, at least in um, cultural institutions, and um, that's really interesting from our point of view because you know as a liver history site. Uh, we try to be a, a real life immersive experience. So what, what's happening is you're getting digital immersive experiences that, that challenge uh, 
that are artificial, I guess, to some extent that are that are becoming as good as the real life experience you could have in visiting uh, a living history site. So I'm finding that pretty interesting. I'm not exactly sure uh, what we'll do about it because, you know, one of the strengths of our program is the the personal aspect of it. I mean, the 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 power of a positive one on one interaction with our staff um, is is that you know, that someone will recommend your site on a social media venue or something like that, um, and their friends will see it and that will drive your visitation. So, you know, if you if you move your program, um, maybe partially because of labor concerns, you do more digital stuff. So there's there's less of that personal interaction. You know what happens to your to your visitation over a longer term. So I mean that really hasn't hit us yet. Um, and we're we're still seeing we were still seeing growth before COVID, and I think we'll be back there. But I think long term it's kind of an interesting trend. Thank you, Jennifer. Have you seen the hotel industry change? Um, I'm probably not as well versed as some of the others here to speak to the industry as a whole, having okay. just gotten back into it from the healthcare side of things uh, just shy of a year ago. But I will say, you know, a couple of things that that we've noticed and we've been speaking about is um, even things like the expectations of our guests are changing um, and the feedback that we're getting from them is changing. So the need to to roll with that and to work with that and to, you know, how does that change our policies and influence our brand standards and, um, and you know, treading as a hotel, we are guided by some brand standards set by, by the Westin, um, but then we're also our own entity. So sort of working within the brand standards to try and get the best we can from our staff to create the memorable experience. I think those things are shifting. And then going back to what we talked a bit about earlier, you know, the trend of, of how we're attracting candidates and how we're getting our workforce and, and what that's doing to the dynamic of our team and how we're infiltrating and amalgamating everyone in and getting people to build those rapports, that's that's changing and, and it's exciting. Um, but I think it's gonna just continue to evolve. I, it's hard to say right now that, this is the thing that's going to change because so much is fluid right now, I think. Susan. Yeah, and just to kind of speak on, I think someone mentioned just kind of like the, uh, just about experience in general. I think guests and travelers are now looking for um, a more range of experiences, whether it be kind of more budget-friendly experiences or really high-end experiences. Um, before we used to kind of just get by with having our few like middle of the road experiences and everybody loved those ones. But now we're finding people definitely want, um, I would say actually the more high end, like in depth sort of like meeting the winemakers or something that's exclusive that only like a handful of people get to do each year or something. So I would say just kind of having more, yeah, more diversity, more, I guess, high end, um, for lack of better terms. And, um, yeah, and then just having more people from different parts of the world, I guess, that we haven't seen. Um, we're starting to get a lot of like inquiries from and and uh, approached by other um, like international tour operators from for groups from that haven't we haven't seen before. So, yeah. Sounds like great news for Nova Scotia, though, and for like overall. Um, you did mention earlier you have some like experiences maybe that kind of keep you going every day. Would you like to touch on those and something like an exciting part of your career? Yeah, I guess I would. Well, the experiences that I was mentioning there, just kind of like our tour experiences and that's how they, um, that's kind of what we're trying to diversify to, I guess, capture a few more um, guests. But uh, yeah. That's something that just kind of keeps you going every day that. I mean, it's really, it's, it's just, it's working and showcasing um, something that we have in our province. So when I came back from traveling in other wine regions. Like I was just so proud that we have a, a product here that we're making in Nova Scotia, just in our climate, like not greenhouses or anything like that, just like with our winters and everything. And we're making some like fantastic wines that are winning awards across um, like the U S like all across the world now. So just showcasing something that Nova Scotia actually does really well is kind of, I mean, that's personally what keeps me going, I guess. Yeah. Janaya, is there a specific event that's kind of really stuck out to you that maybe you could expand on for the story for the students? Yeah, um, you know it's funny because I I 
was an event manager earlier in my career. And, you know, one of the events that I hosted uh, or sorry, that I managed that's always stuck with me was um, when the National Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was uh, traveling throughout the country and they did have a stop in Halifax. And that was a really impactful event for me. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about our history and and uh, where we want to go in the future. So that was really impactful. Um, I would say uh, in the summer, uh, we hosted a national corporate event that was um, one of the largest events that Halifax has ever seen. Uh, and it was uh, 1,200 uh, individuals from across the country uh, that came to Halifax to really be immersed in the experience. I know that they took advantage of uh, the Citadel site as well and hosted, uh, you know, a really uh, extravagant event um, with with uh, at that location. Um, you know, they took advantage of uh, t um, transportation companies in the city. They used almost all the hotels in the city. Uh, our uh, event planner um, partners were engaged in that process. Uh, there were so many organizations that took part in delivering that experience. It was a really special one, uh, which I think reputationally, Halifax uh, and 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 all of our partners that were involved in that pulled off and really made a name for ourselves in the corporate market. So I do expect, you know, that that brings a lot of revenue to the city. And really from the Convention Center and Scotiabank Center, our purpose is really to, we exist to help drive the economy. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that's why we, that's why we exist. And that's, you know, part of the joy of coming to work every day, seeing the impact that we have on our community, on our province, um, and all of the things that go along with that. Um, you know, one of the other things that's really special right now is uh, more so at the convention center, we've really uh, taken a new focus on local and how do we start to build better relationships with the agriculture community um, to be able to service these large uh, groups of people that come to the city um, so that we can serve them the, the food that's locally grown and we can serve them the drinks that are locally grown. Uh, when we opened the convention center, we were serving Starbucks coffee and we've just recently announced that we have a partnership with Just Us, which is a local company. So every delegate that comes through the doors of the convention center is going to get a cup of just us coffee and how amazing is that so for me that's what gets me up in the morning it's knowing the impact of what we do and how it really touches uh you know our province from end to end and, and specifically our city every single day so <laughs> well i don't know if i could put into <laughs> just one specific event i mean there's there's sort of events every day that take place i mean <clears throat> I used to see kids interacting with our with our costume staff, um, getting really excited about a scavenger hunt they're working on. Uh, it brings back sort of memories of one's own experiences uh, in these kinds of sites uh, when uh, when I was younger, and that the the, the 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 those are part of the things that got me interested in in uh, looking more deeply into historical stuff and kind of led me to where I was. So that's one gets a charge out of that. I think there's also things like. When we put together something new that that um, that uh, that draws on you know both the educational aspect that we can offer, uh, being entertaining, and also has a revenue aspect to it, um, allows us to get messages out about the Canadian past, um, allows us to, to engage people, and also allows us to perpetuate ourselves because we're uh, deriving revenue from it as well. And um, you know the. I think one of those is the 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 tasting programs that we put together. I think one of the first tasting programs that I they shadowed. We went into the barreling room. The distiller was there. He cracked open the barrel. He was, you know, drew a thing out from uh, the whiskey barrel, and then we were we were tasting whiskey right from the barrel. So that was kind of a pretty cool thing in this like you know drippy wet uh, room in the back of the Citadel with all these these um, casks all around. So yeah, there's just. Um, things every day that happen there that kind of keep you motivated. Just an exciting job overall, hey? <laughs> and Jennifer? I think the thing that excites me is the people. Um, I, you know, I'm in human resources, so I'm about the training and development and, and that, but the idea that in some small way I can positively influence even just one staff person in a day because 
they need to talk about something or they they have a question about something, then they know that we have our open door policy and that they've got a reliable, consistent team in place that is going to help that you know them tap into their skill set and develop new ones and really enhance their experience the idea that i can in any way enhance someone's experience and support them to be then creating memorable guest experiences is is wonderful um selfishly that's something that feel it feels great um and when you feel great about where you're going into work and you enjoy the people you work with that's the biggest part of the battle i think you know <sighs> There's no one event, although I will say the Weston hosts the Halifax International Security Forum, uh, which is a very large scale event in November of each year. It's This was the 14th year and my first um, HISF with the company, and it is it's world leaders, world military leaders, Secretary of Defense, all sorts of people very, very top level security clearance. And there is so much preparation for so many months behind the scenes. And then, and then it happens and the hotel is a buyout and it was magnificent. It was bananas in some respects. I couldn't believe that this place of work had been completely transformed. Um, and we had this event over a long weekend and it is Everyone works. Everyone works the entire weekend. We bring in, um, you know, staff who maybe the former HR director came and helped out for a few days. I was helping in the restaurant. I do not have food and beverage experience, but you know, it it is all hands on deck. And there was something really special about pitching in in the restaurant and clearing dishes and just you know everyone working together for a common goal was really lovely. Thank you. I will ask one final question before we open the floor. Um, this is a very diverse industry. What are some like skills that the students are going to need to go into it? And like, what is some advice that perhaps you could give for these students that are going to enter it soon for some of them? Susan, start with you. Um, some of the skills I would say, I mean, you have to enjoy being a leader. I think you have to enjoy kind of taking charge and, sometimes being the center of attention or in, in my specific job, always the center of attention, but I'm okay with that. And so is the staff that I, I have working for me. Um, but also too, um, I feel like it's really important just in any, when you're kind of moving from your school career to your career is to have a mentor, not even so many like a formal mentor, but just somebody that you can trust to kind of help you make decisions. If it's a family member or if it's somebody um, in another business that you know, or maybe it's, you know, with a part-time job or something. And just uh, also just the benefit of networking and just kind of being in touch with people from different industries um, from kind of a more uh, professional standpoint. And you just never know kind of what opportunities are kind of kind of open up for you. And I would say that that's kind of true for myself and kind of how I get into, um, you know, my role in, in, in having a small business, but also all of the people that work for me uh, with Great Escapes and Taste Halifax, like none of them have thought they would be tour guides before and they absolutely love what they do. And so also to just like realizing that you might have a skill set that you don't haven't like totally tapped into that might, you know, give you a lot of success in your career anyway. Take chances. Rod, do you have anything to add on to that? Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person to be giving advice, but <laughs> um, but I guess what I'd say that um, 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 cultivating a skill of learning how to learn uh, would, I think, serves you well in whatever you get into. Um, from my point of view, you're way ahead of where I was at your age, <laughs> uh, in terms of like being in a program like this, that has a sort of more focused, um, outcome. Um, I mean, I was, uh, I spent a long time after, um, uh, where you guys are at, um, still trying to figure out where I wanted to go. So you're way ahead of me, I think. Um, um, and I, I think the other thing is that, to keep in mind that it's never too late to do things differently. Uh, so I, I always found that a, a comfort when I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do is like, well, I, there's all these stories of people who have changed up what they're looking to do um, later in life. So I think there's almost almost time to do that. You look like you're in agreement down there. 
They're both saying really smart things. Um, <laughs> networking, I would say, is is a big one and, and something that I know when I first got out of school, I didn't feel, I don't know that I had the confidence enough then, you know, oh, I'm, I've just, I'm newly graduated. I don't know that I have the skills or the, but, but just taking small steps and really making an effort there, particularly never in any other industry I've been in, has networking been such a big part? Um, and so influential and so exciting as in hospitality, um, you know, communication, you know, it tied into networking, you know, when you're, when you're meeting someone you've connected, sending a LinkedIn request or staying connected to people, right. Recognizing that everyone's got a lot going on. It might not be an instant reply, but if you meet someone who's impacted you or you've learned something from, or you've heard speak and you think, they really, you know, that really resonated with me, or I really liked what they were saying about this to Susan's point about a mentor, you know, I think making those connections and, and initiating and taking steps to really actively do that um, helps a lot. And other than that, I think just keep, yeah, keep learning. It's, it's not a linear path. So you'd be surprised where you might end up. And it, it's also hard on the job market sometimes and that. So, you know, if, if this feels like it's got, it's not the ideal job that you had in mind, but it has a lot of opportunity to grow and a lot of opportunity to um, hone new skills and get new experience, then, then you don't be afraid necessarily to just because it's not exactly the path that you imagined for yourself. Um, I had a big path mapped out, but you know, don't be afraid to take some of those chances and risks because I think they wind up paying off and the networking opportunities can be huge. Yeah, and I'll just kind of jump on that. Um, I think one of the things, uh, you know, that you need to remember is it's it's okay to make mistakes. And I think sometimes we hold ourselves back because we're scared to make a mistake, um, but don't be. That's how you learn and that's how you grow. Um, I think, you know, from a, from a, from a leadership perspective, I mean, in any or any of the roles that, you know, you may look to take on in the future, chances are you're going to have, you know, maybe a handful of people uh, that report to you or, you know, it may not feel like a big, large team, but just thinking about, you know, some of those core leadership competencies. And one of the things I, I find in our industry, things can get really heated very quickly. It sometimes can be very intense. Having some self-awareness and, and you know, paying attention to how you react to things, uh, it's something I I have worked um, over the last several years on just making sure that, you know, I am aware of how I'm coming across to, it might not be my employees, but it could be other employees as well, or team members. And just, you know, the, to me, it's something I think no matter how many people you supervise, or if you don't even directly supervise people, um, people are watching and paying attention to you as you grow throughout your career. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, and I'll just kind of jump off of what was said earlier is, take opportunities when they're presented to you. Uh, it's amazing what can come your way. Um, I'll give you a very small example. On Monday, um, I took over an entirely new team within our organization and it's focused on food and beverage. I know nothing about food and beverage. I can barely calculate basic food costs. So it's an opportunity that was presented to me um, and it doesn't come with a title increase and it doesn't come with, you know, compensation right now. It's, it's but it's about the opportunity to do it. Um, so everyone can wish me luck in my, in my adventure on that end. So. Thank you very much. All great advice. Our, our students, whoa, sorry. Keep forgetting how close that is to me. Are students able to connect with you perhaps after LinkedIn, send a message? Yeah. Perfect. Take advantage of that. It's amazing. Um, I will open the floor up now to some questions from our students online as well. If you have questions, I can read those out. If you're in the room, I will bring the microphone to you. Thanks, Emma, and thanks to all of you. This has been really interesting. My name is Shelley, and I'm a part-time student in the tourism and hospitality degree program. So I kind of appreciated Rod's comment there where it's never too late to do something new. <laughs> so I worked for many years for a financial institution, uh, originally starting off in the hospitality industry. So I worked for the Sheraton Hotel, and it was called the Sheraton Oh, did you? <laughs> and we, I grew up knowing uh, the Westin as the Nova Scotian Hotel. <laughs> 
and Scotiabank Center was the Metro Center. Thankfully, uh, the Halifax Citadel pretty much stayed the same, although we always called it Citadel Hill. <laughs> and it was a staple for visiting uh, whenever any out-of-town guests came. Citadel Hill, Peggy's Cove. Yeah. And uh, we have a lot to offer. So I am, I, I am kind of, I have lots of questions, but I'll just start with one. And uh, Jenea, uh, we just recently went, I, for my first time ever, to the lacrosse game back in February in the long weekend. I've never even seen one before. And I just want to congratulate you and your team. It was a really good experience. I felt like a little kid. I was walking around like, I haven't seen these kiosks. Like, where'd they come from? And it used to just be the concession stands. And so obviously, I haven't been there for a while. And how they transformed it from the ice rink has been like two nights later. Later, my son is at the Mooseheads game. I'm like, what? And it was very well attended. So well done. The ticket scanning, super fast. Yeah, my son just when he was helping at the uh, St. Mary's uh, hockey game there the other night, he's like, they need to learn from the Scotiabank Center. So there you go. I would ask a question to you as a mature student and somebody older, what kind of job opportunities might be available other than the entry level positions in your organization? So I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily always just base it on base it on age, but when I think about your education and um, you know what you're working towards, uh, I would say there are, um, I'll call them management uh, roles that range from things like uh, event coordination, uh, to food and beverage, um, we call them captains, but they are, you know, management level, uh, employees, um, and, and guest experience is a place where we're really, uh, looking to enhance the experience of, of fans and guests. Um, and so we have changed our operating structure to include a guest experience manager. Uh, and those all, of course, all come with supervisory, uh, roles, um, sales and marketing, uh, so we do have a sales and a business development team. So depending on your strengths and some of uh, those areas, uh, there are opportunities within uh, business development, marketing and communications. Um, so as our organization grows and and we, you know, we become and we have been becoming more proactive about the events that we seek and um, some of the work in that end, it's led to this really uh, fantastic structure that, you know, it does put... Um, you know, levels of expertise in the right space. I think I admitted to the group earlier, business development is not my strong point, um, but I have a team of experts in business development that can support me as we as we require it in the operation. So those are some of the types of roles. We also have a finance department. So depending on, once again, where your your passion and your skill set lies, um, that's that's also an opportunity within our organization. So corporate services, I guess, if you will, that kind of that area. So yeah, you're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Winnie, uh, nice to meet you. And as a, a nearly graduate um, tourism students, because I'm going to graduate by December, I really want to work in the tourism sectors. And I also have some experience as a tour guide, work in the uh, uh, Cream Harbor on the waterfront. And then I have the experience of like uh, what Susan said. Some, some people are from cruise ship, it's really hard to express them. And also I have some tour, uh, tourists that they come from uh, Vancouver and Toronto. They are Chinese um, um, society, uh, belongs to the immigration. Um, but they think about Halifax is just like passing by stops because they are heading to PEI. So I was wondering, in because all of you are from different sectors, how would us, are the operators working in the Halifax or Nova Scotia working together to bring something more experience, culture based on the culture and the history to bring a new brand, change their mindsets, and what kind of uh, promotional ways that you would thinking could be cooperating together to change that? Uh, thank you. <laughs> So, so I'm not totally sure I understood the question, Winnie, but um, I guess I would say um, as someone who um, manages a program that that delivers a, the uh, programming at two national historic sites in the city, I would say, you know, we, we have a good base uh, for 
um, uh, for promoting Halifax on the basis of its history and culture already. Um, and I know that's part of the new tourism campaign as well. I just saw uh, one of the they just they just released it. Uh, but this week, I think um, it was just on Monday, they did the webinar or whatever. So, um, you know, we're uh, shots of the Citadel and and the costume interpreters are part of that. So, I mean, I think I think um, the history and culture of Halifax is al already part of the the um, marketing efforts that the tour that um, that um, Nova Scotia tourism is spearheading. Um, so I'm not sure were you looking was there additional things you were looking um you thought uh, could be added or do do you think it's enough like because like they still coming from last summer they still think this is just a middle stop what can we do more to to change their minds because uh, Susan understand me what I'm saying yeah. right I th I know I think we kind of spoke about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, Winnie, and I think um, it's because we're having, uh, I guess, the problem that you're kind of seeing or what you're trying to kind of find a solution to is a lot of Chinese descent travelers that are coming from Vancouver and Toronto, and they're on kind of like bus tours. Are they on more like sort of bu bus tours? Yes. Yeah. So they're on bus tours and they're coming and like the attraction is more so New Brunswick, PEI and not Nova Scotia, right? They're just like stopping by here or whatever. I think maybe it's like it's trying to find out working with the tour operator who's ever operating those tours and really pitching the parts of Nova Scotia that can really um, uh, be kind of the highlights on those tours. Because there's no doubt that Nova Scotia does have some great highlighting ports, uh, like uh, highlighting points for all types of travelers coming in. But sometimes it's just, I think, like working with the middleman to try to figure out like what like how can we make Nova Scotia a part of the, the a bigger part of the stop or a bigger part of the tour? I don't know. Think about the events as well. And because event you will bring people to to promote that this is a historical sign and things. But even like we have a higher level of like uh, campaigns, but are these things are really get into the local people's mind. So that's what I'm thinking. Is there any more that's what Susan's saying. Is there any more way that we can do from hotel, from uh, the tourism operator, from events that we can bring something, bring them in, and that would change a lot? I think. I'm I'm not really sure if I'm answering your question, but but it sounds like there is a gap that you've identified, um, and and I am just what's coming to mind for me is there are different organizations that might be able to answer that question for you a bit better than we can, like, um, and I'm thinking Discover Halifax. Um, I don't know if the Halifax Partnership would also be an organization that could um, could support kind of your thinking and, and help maybe give it a bit more direction. Uh, contacts at Tourism Nova Scotia. Um, like, that's kind of what I'm thinking, because I actually think they may, there clearly is a, a gap, and they may be able to provide a bit more insight um, than, than this group can. It's just a thought. Yeah, yeah. I do have two questions here online as well. Um, the first one is, it was mentioned that guest expectations are changing. Can you be more specific as to what those are? Um, I think I mentioned it. Um, I, I would just, I, I, I don't know that I can be more specific, to be honest. Um, I, I do think one of the areas, and I was specifically speaking about our, you know, our, our, our venue that's a bit older, um, accessibility, um, has changed. I think historically when you thought about being an accessible venue, you kind of went to a place where, well, can someone in a wheelchair come here? Sure. Great. We've checked that box of accessibility. That's not what that means. Um, and it probably never did. It just, this is, this is the expectation now is being mindful, uh, about different, um, you know, about different disabilities, uh, different accessibility requirements and, and being able to host events where it doesn't matter what what um, what your disability or what your accessibility challenge is, that you can partake and experience that event um, just like everyone else. Um, one of the examples I know in arenas across the world, there's this thing where you know it's it's hard to um, have someone who has accessibility challenges sit on the floor of a concert because of exit capacity and how would they get out in the event of a fire? Well, 
there's ways you can work around that. And once again, small, small steps, but we had a couple of concerts where we actually talked to the band manager and we talked to the promoter to say, okay, in the event of an emergency, can we actually bring this person backside stage? And the answer was yes. So it, when you think about the expectation of people, when they come to events, they want to be able to enjoy them just like everyone else. Um, I would say out of the pandemic, um, what I'm seeing from guest behavior, uh, there's a, just a different, um, there's a different type of person that's coming to events now. And some of the behaviors or some of the, um, you know, uh, discussions that we have with customers, um, you know, you can see things get escalated pretty quickly. Uh, and so it's, it's also about paying attention to some of the feedback we're getting and, and arming our teams with de-escalation solutions to once again, you know, not get into a back and forth with the customer, but to really try to understand what they're upset about and, and work towards a solution so that they're, you know, that they, that they leave with a great experience. So, um, I don't know that that really answered the question, but, there's a different tone and flavor now about what people, even when you go to buy a beer, you don't want to wait in line for 20 minutes to buy a beer. So how do we make sure that we've got those concession carts set up in, in the right way? Um, it's, it's stuff like that, that it's just the expectation of going somewhere and going to an event has changed from, you know, what it, what it historically was. So hopefully that answers a bit of the question. I think it answered it well, but Jennifer, I see you might have. I was just going to say, I know I had mentioned guest expectations had had changed. And what I would say is very much what you were just articulating, you know, the we get so much conference business. That's really the bread and butter at the Westin. But we do get a lot of leisure travelers coming. Right. And and post not that we're completely out of it, but sort of last summer, all of a sudden occupancy was back a 100 percent um, all of a sudden, which was incredible. But you know, there's different policies now and still working within the needing to meet brand standards, but brand standards are different from prior to the COVID. So likely different from prior to when these people were last traveling, um, you know, housekeeping, you know, there was just so much that was different and the expectation had never been higher. Um, and, you know, rates in Halifax for hotels had never been higher. Um, and so all of a sudden these leisure travelers were coming, couples, singles, families, coming and spending a significant amount to stay at a hotel, having as a result, very, very high expectations. And maybe it's the first time they've been able to take a trip in years. So, you know, expectations from that perspective of what you're hoping for and to get out of it were higher. So the feedback we were getting was, um, I suppose in some respects, like a little more critical than what we'd previously seen, um, a little bit more nitpicky. I would argue sometimes escalation was more quick to happen. So all of that was, was new. And so, yeah, providing staff the support and the training to ensure they could manage and navigate in those situations appropriately and safely, um, you know, working within a gray area and trying to to figure that out sort of on a case by case basis. So it's definitely been interesting. I don't know that that helped answer any further, but so. that's sort of where it seems to be at. Yeah. The... Thank you. If we have any, do we have any more in the room? Yeah, absolutely. That, I just think that's so interesting be, because of my age. And so I have young adult children. And so you could even I can see the expectation from that generation. So from what I expect, so going to Scotiabank Center, I just, I'm like, oh, well, we're just going to be in the crowd. We're going to move. And they're just like, no, no, let's get this going, get the going. I'm pulling out my paper ticket. They're showing their phone. We're going up. They're like, look at all the selection. They expect to see selection. I'm just like, well, let's just go to the concession stand. No, we're going over to the specialty hot dogs and expectation going to a hotel. My daughter did a girl's weekend getaway to the Sutton place and ate at Chop. We go to the Hampton Inn. <laughs> so the expectation, you're going into a luxury hotel like that, there's a generation that is putting the bar up here. And so what 
I might, I mean, I'm looking for cleanliness and I'm just looking for no music during the lacrosse game. And I'm like, are they going to turn this down? And they're like, no, this is part of the fun. So I think there's just a, di a generation of um, visitor expectation too. And I just, I'm just sort of throwing that in based from my perspective as my age. I do want to say, like, our guests are amazing. I just want to be clear. We're very excited about all of the people, but it is interesting. And I think more often than not, the communication is the big key piece. If when someone's checking in or starting a tour or going to event, it's clearly sign marked and the communication is very clear in terms of, you know, right now we're not doing turndown service. That's not something that we can provide from a safety measure. So but if you require something else, all you have to do is let the front desk know. So I think everyone's trying to catch up and be as proactive with the communication as possible so that most people are pretty happy from that respect. We have come to the end of time of the session, not the world. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you folks are happy to answer one more question. I'm sure maybe some of us would be happy to stay to listen to them. It's totally up to you guys. I do have an easy one here. It is basically just since tourism and hospitality careers can be so varied and it can be very lateral industry, what kind of transferable skills are you looking for when you're hiring? Uh, this doesn't answer the question fully, but I think in a lot of the roles, um, I think in this industry, a lot of it comes down to passion, comes down to, um, you know, customer uh, interactions um, and and a lot of the other things can be, that's something we can work on. If you're passionate about this industry, you, you understand what you're signing up for. Um, you love coming to work every day. I think a lot of the other things um, will work with you on that because it's, you can't you can't train on passion. You can't train on commitment, um, but you can you can train and provide some support on the rest of those things. So that's my thought. Yeah, it's just the willingness to learn yeah. for sure. I would say, particular to hotels, I can't speak for the rest of you, but within hotels, it actually is a huge asset, particularly as you continue in your career. If you're looking to be a supervisor at a managerial level, you know, as a department head. The, the fact that our banquets manager might have had previous housekeeping experience and that because it, it just it all works together and you need one another so much and the departments are so interconnected that that in and of itself is a transferable skill that really bolsters someone's CV and experience. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say all of that. And then I think empathy stands out for me lately as a. Uh, as a key um, competency. Uh, I mean, um, as was said earlier, uh, we're seeing um, increased um, demands from guests, I guess. Um, more confrontational maybe is not, is maybe is a bit um, going a bit too far, but certainly um, guests who are wanting to challenge the information that guides are giving them, and sometimes um, not in the uh, politest of ways. I think this is a, you know, a small minority of the overall thing, but <laughs> from what I understand, it's not just at our site, it's sort of across the country that that um, um, people who are giving information of that kind of nature are, are experiencing. Um, so the ability of someone to um, feel empathy, even for the person who is asking the question, even under strenuous circumstances, is a, is a real key because um, it gives one the opportunity to get into discussions about the subject matter that's being raised in a way that um, will hopefully give the questioner something to think about, um, challenge their assumptions, and um, uh, have, have something for them to take away to think about. Amazing. Thank you very much to the four of you. If you could all join me in thanking our panel today, it'd be great. I've learned a lot. Hopefully all of our tourism students have, have as well. I will just remind all of our students, it is a learning passport eligible event. Surveys are all on Moodle. Get them in within 48 hours for your points. And if you haven't signed in um, over here, Paulette has the um, attendance sheet. If you could sign that, please. Perfect. Thank you very much.